Hello and welcome along. Um, as Adele said, I'm Jamie Chapman. Um, I'm a lecturer in the School of Medicine, coordinate uh, first year unit uh, CZZ uh, 101 Human Anatomy Physiology 1A. I'm campus coordinator for the second semester unit. Uh, I also teach into the uh, MBBS program the first two years of histology. Um, and uh, I've been involved with online learning for, for a number of years now. Um, I was involved with a uh, OLT project uh, a number of years ago with people from Adelaide University where we introduced flipped classroom to our teaching. So yeah, so um, I've been creating online uh, resources for, for a number of years and a different number of different modalities. And so I thought maybe it might be useful if I showed you how I go about um, creating online resources from existing PowerPoint lectures. Um, and um, yeah, and so Adele suggested I might want to run a little workshop as part of the EdTech, uh, Med EdTech uh, group here. Okay, so during the workshop, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, uh, present a challenge of converting face-to-face uh, -face lectures into an online uh, module, online resource. Uh, and when we do that, I'm going to sort of give a, a very brief overview of uh, the theory of uh, learning applied to online videos, uh, which is really quite important. And in fact, you know, this is something which I've, I've learned myself fairly recently through um, delving into the literature for, for writing a, a paper on um, introducing online teaching for histology, for example. And um, it's interesting, I found that, you know, like most of us probably doing things which actually have a theoretical background, but we just didn't realise that it had a theoretical background about why it was working and how we keep adapting our, our resources. Um, and, you know, they actually have um, a pedagogical basis for, for why they work. Um, so um, it's new to me. It may be um, old news to you, so I apologise if um, it's something which you've already explored, but um, I found it very fascinating. It's really quite an interesting uh, thing to keep in your forefront of your mind as you work to create these online resources. Uh, and then I'm actually going to run through a, a quick example of how I chunk my PowerPoint lectures. Uh, and then at the end, if there's time, uh, I'll quickly uh, outline uh, how you can create drawing style videos if you want to go down that pathway. So of course, our challenge and our goal is to somehow convert what we do uh, we have done up until COVID-19 uh, a didactic face-to-face -face lecture into an, an online module. Uh, and of course, many of us know that part of um, the way we deliver is, is really a presentation of sorts. Um, and how do you actually translate your ability to present uh, into an online module? Something which is um, engaging and uh, keeps students engaged. Uh, and of course, it's quite a, a different environment that they'll be engaging in. So um, in a face-to-face -face lecture, they're in a lecture theatre, there's much fewer uh, distractions going on in their lives <laughs> in a lecture theatre than, for example, sitting uh, in their lounge room with the dog jumping on their lap and making a cup of tea and the TV's on in the background and they've got kids running around and, you know, they've got to get on to dinner and all these extra extraneous things going on in their lives. So we do need to make our videos engaging uh, for while <laughs> they actually do pay attention. And of course, we also need to make sure that we're relaying that information effectively. Um, you know, we could theoretically just put up last year's lecture recording, um, but as I say, with all those extra distractions, I don't know how engaging that would be uh, with all uh, everything else going on in their lives. So we need to make sure that the information we are presenting is as effectively delivered as it possibly can. And this sort of relates quite heavily into our understanding of uh, learning theory, uh, in particular our understanding of uh, cognitive load theory. So there's this really interesting um, uh, theory uh, based on uh, multimedia learning called the Cognitive Theory of Multimedia Learning. And it's based upon three research supported principles in, in cognitive science. Now, the first of these is the idea uh, that we have two channels and it's called the dual channels principle that uh, as learners, we have separate channels for processing verbal material and we have a separate channel for processing pictorial material. So um, words either heard or uh, read and uh, images, uh, we have separate channels that, for processing those. 
and that when we get the information, we actually have a limited capacity uh, to actually process that material. So we, this is the limited capacity principle, that learners can process only a few elements in each channel at any one time, otherwise it gets overloaded and then uh, it doesn't actually move into a uh, long-term memory. And then thirdly, the third principle is the active processing principle. And that says that meaningful learning occurs when learners engage in appropriate cognitive processing during learning. That is that they actually start to process that information appropriately. And it's based on whether they're actually focusing on the relevant material so that they actually only have that goal material that you want them to know, then lots of extraneous material that they are actually mentally organising that material into coherent cognitive representation. So they're forming models based on the images and sounds and words that they're actually hearing. And we actually need to be able to give them space and time to actually do that. And that they're also integrating it with prior knowledge, uh, which is activated from long term memory. So the idea, of course, is over uh, a semester in our units, we're slowly building up that information and that prior knowledge that they gain can be help, uh, used to help move the rest of that material into their long-term memory. And of course, they can uh, students can affect that as well by the amount of time that they revise and how effective they are with that revision process as well. And of course, this all works uh, in concert with the idea of uh, human memory. And I apologise to any neuroscientists in the audience because uh, I assume this is correct, but you know, um, neuroscientists have a lot more background information on this than me. Uh, that there's three types of uh, human working memory in humans. There's sensory memory, um, so the information we get from our environment, and that's held as an exact copy of what was presented for a very brief period of time in our memory. We then take little snippets of that sensory memory and we move it into working memory. And this holds a more processed version of the input material for a shorter period of time. And um, we can only process a few pieces of material at any one time uh, in our working memory before it then uh, can move into long-term memory. Uh, and that holds, of course, your entire hard drive of knowledge uh, for long periods of time. And basically it works on the concept that sensory and long-term memories have an unlimited capacity. Uh, so that idea that the more you learn, the more that falls out of your brain, you sort of forget how to walk after a while because you've read a book. Um, it doesn't really play. Um, when working memory has a limited capacity for processing information, um, so that's our bottleneck. So it's sort of about five to seven pieces of information, either through the visual or the auditory uh, inputs, uh, and any more than that, and uh, we become overloaded, and um, then that working memory sort of doesn't work anymore, and we don't get anything moving into the long-term memory. And so pictorially presented here, uh, this is it here. So we have our multimedia presentation, our video that we're going to create. It's going to contain words. They may be text form. They may be auditory, you know, you're narrating something. Uh, they may contain images uh, there. And of course, they're picked up by our um, ears and our eyes. Um, and we start to um, take in that information. And then it moves into our working memory. We begin to select words and select images. We can't take it all in. We can only, remembering, we can only take in a, a small amount uh, and then begin to link those uh, images and sounds together, begin to actually organize them into models, verbal models, pictorial models, and start to work them into uh, our understanding. And that way um, they can actually move into long-term memory. And of course, um, those models that they're creating are better better um, integrated and the better the models are based upon prior knowledge. So while we don't have an error, uh, form uh, those models more appropriately, appropriately and then move into to long term memory. And as I say, the student study methods, um, this plays an important role too with things like um, space retrieval practice. Uh, once they heard something once, they go back after a little while, they've got this prior knowledge now that helps them to integrate that model better and so on. 
And so cognitive load then, um, this is what it's all based on, is sort of, you know, that interplay between memory, our understanding of memory, and, and um, now our cognitive load. We have sort of three components to cognitive load. Uh, the first component is known as intrinsic cognitive load. Now this really isn't always um, influenced by um, what we create, it's actually about the content that we're delivering. It's about the complexity of that new information uh, that we're delivering. And so we can try wherever possible to actually make that a bit more simple. And that's some of the ways we can do that is actually um, simplify the way we actually present it so they're not overloaded by this uh, intrinsic cognitive load. Extraneous cognitive load we have the biggest influence on in our in the design of our, our resources. So this is anything that sort of distracts the working memory from processing that information. Anything that's going to distract uh, and add to that uh, working memory, uh, it's going to um, fill up that channel quite quickly. Um, so if you're using too many colours or there's too many words or there's too many pictures on your slides, then that's all going to be extraneous information. Really, your goal is to present that content and you want to present it as simply as you can so that then the students can use their germane cognitive load where they actually can process that information and start to form those models uh, linking the, the visual and the uh, verbal components and hopefully move that into, um, into their long-term memory. So of course, if you give a presentation and it's high in intrinsic load, there's lots of words, um, it's quite a complex topic and there's lots of extra information going on. There's not much room then for the germane cognitive load for students to actually process that information properly. Um, so what we're trying to do is reduce, uh, simplify um, that content we're delivering, we're trying to reduce the amount of extraneous cognitive load so that students have more and more time to actually process that information. So there's a number of things that you can do to uh, your content to actually help reduce cognitive load. So one of those things that you can do um, to help with uh, simplify um, your content is to use signaling queuing on screen. Yeah, that's exactly right, Dale. So yeah, extra things, even though um, there's humour, there's a whole variety of, of um, things going on. You do want to make a rapport with your audience. You do want to try to be personable as much as you can, but by providing some of this extra stuff, you are actually adding to extraneous cognitive load and, and that's not the goal uh, of what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to actually get that information across. Um, so signaling queuing is the use of on-screen text or symbols to highlight important information. So you might animate uh, text or you might make it a different color that pops up or something like that so that students recognize that word that's in their visual field and um, that's um, really important for them to mem remember in their working memory. Uh, weeding is actually getting rid of this extraneous cognitive load, getting rid of anything that's really not contributing to your learning goal. Um, so like Dale was saying, you know, you might be adding a few funny memes and that might help with the, uh, them keeping attendance, but of course it's not actually helping with them actually understanding that content. Um, so there, there's obviously an interplay there. Uh, matching modality, uh, so this is where you try to use both channels uh, to help reinforce that content, both the audio ver verbal channel and the visual pictorial channel to convey new information. Uh, so this works on the idea that if you've got an animation running, for example, you probably don't want to have a lot of text on screen. Uh, you can have um, narration to that audio, but you probably don't want a lot of text next to it as well because you're overloading that visual um, pictorial channel. Now this is actually interesting because there's a finding coming up in some research which kind of um, is a little bit opposite to this but we'll talk about that in a, in a little while. Uh, and lastly segmenting, this is of, um, again related to the intrinsic cognitive load where we're trying to simplify the information we're presenting rather having than a big long 50 minute presentation you're going to break it up into smaller pieces that's much more manageable for a student to actually um, delve into and spend time on and spend a little bit more time trying to move the, into the germane cognitive load so they can process that information. And that's going to be the focus of the main part of the uh, last part of, of this uh, workshop here. 
And so this is just a little table uh, which I found uh, yesterday. I'm not going to go through it at all, but it's got some helpful tips on how to um, uh, remove uh, or use these uh, different components to reduce the various loads and, and how you can get rid of those. So I'm going to, it's in the notes, of course, that you can have a look in your own time, but yeah, they're just sort of examples there. So how does this actually play into practice? Um, so there was a really interesting piece of research done in 2014 by uh, Guo and others uh, that looked at student engagement with videos uh, in the MOOC space um, and in the edX MOOCs. And uh, using 6.9 million video watching sessions, they looked at uh, which videos were preferred, which had the longest amount of time that um, the students engaged with it. Um, and, you know, did students sc scrub through them really quickly or did they actually watch the entire thing? What's the average length of time of viewing and so on? And they had a number of uh, key findings, which interestingly follows quite closely to um, our idea of cognitive load. So their first key finding uh, was, of course, that shorter videos are much more engaging. So they have an idea of about six minutes, although if you sort of read into their paper a little bit more, you can have a little bit longer if you've got um, less distractions, I suppose, and, and it's, um, you know, you've actually taken, reduced that intrinsic load a little bit, I suppose. Um, so shorter videos are much more engaging and that's the idea of chunking um, or segmenting your presentation. Now this is the interesting one. Videos that intersperse and instructors talking head with slides are more engaging than slides alone. So I've actually recently started doing this uh, in some of my presentations. But if we think back to that um, dual modality uh, concept, really it shouldn't <laughs> it shouldn't work like that because you're actually adding an extra uh, component to the visual field or the visual channel. And so theoretically. Um, it should be distracting from um, that um, because they're not allowing, you know, sort of overloading that extraneous information, I suppose. Um, but I suppose outside of the concept of cognitive load, we're also thinking about what keeps students engaged um, and what motivates students to actually learn and study. And part of that actually comes from the relationship that a student feels with their lecturer and how um, supported they feel and how personal that they feel uh, related to that, that presenter. And so I suppose in a sense, um, this is not so much about cognitive load, this is actually more about uh, that concept of being uh, related, feeling a relationship with the person that they're um, being instructed by. Videos produced with a more personal feel could be more engaging than high fidelity studio recordings. Now, I don't know how many of you were at the, um, we had a School of Medicine education um, workshop a couple of years ago, we had a guy called Jason Lodge, Adele organised to come and give us a presentation. And he'd been doing research on videos and um, looking at what makes a good video for education. And he showed this nice graph that showed, uh, that compared quality with education uh, or learning. And there's a really interesting tipping point from between where a video, video's quality tips over into a uh, actually detracting from learning experience by students. And he called it the Brian Coxification of educational videos, where once you reach a certain uh, quality, students potentially see it as entertainment rather than educational. So actually having not the highest quality video, um, you know, maybe uh, not the highest quality produced uh, audio uh, may actually be of benefit because students feel more of a personal relationship with that than something which is very high quality uh, in production, which is actually nice for, <laughs> for many of us uh, who uh, don't always have um, high quality uh, produced videos. I don't know if, how many of you have seen the um, Khan Academy style videos on YouTube, um, but Khan style tablet drawing tutorials are more engaging than PowerPoint screencasts. And I will talk about this at, uh, towards the end of the, the workshop if we've got time. Uh, videos where instructors speak fairly fast and with high enthusiasm are more engaging. And again, this sort of is a little bit opposite of, you know, the idea that there's lots of auditory information coming in. Um, this may not work necessarily for students with English as a second language, um, but, you know, that moving away from a monotone type of um, presentation will probably keep students a little bit more engaged.
And lastly, students engage differently with lecture and with tutorial videos. So lectures, they tend to watch once and then, you know, make notes and don't go back to them. Or tutorials, they tend to re-watch and skim over to the parts that they find particularly important. So um, that's, that's uh, an interesting finding there as well. All right then, so that's a little bit of the boring um, educational principle side of things. Uh, how do we actually go about creating your online videos? Just how I sort of take my PowerPoint presentation, my normal 50 minute PowerPoint presentation, and I break it down into smaller chunks. And really I learned this through my um, flip classroom experience with the OOT project. And so it actually applies really well in this space as well. So how do you chunk your PowerPoint? Of course, you start with your 50 minute PowerPoint presentation. You need to actually deliver this in the online environment as an asynchronous presentation. Um, so you start with your PowerPoint that you would normally deliver in the face to face space and you start to think about how can I break it down into smaller bite sized videos. So the first thing that you do is you actually look for natural breaks in the content. Now, most of us have these uh, in our um, PowerPoint videos already. Okay, so this is a video, or this is a, a lecture which I gave, uh, or I've been giving for a number of years on the reproductive systems uh, to our, our first year medical students. And so you can see it's, I mean, I'm in the slide sorter uh, field here. So you can see here, there's the title slide, um, there's the learning objectives, and then there's uh, the presentation. So what you do is you have your PowerPoint presentation and you start to look for areas where there's natural breaks. Um, and everyone knows that they tend to have these in their, their presentation. Um, so what I tend to do is, um, so here I introduce the reproductive systems and then I talk about uh, meiosis. And then I talk about the male reproductive system. So there's a the natural break here between uh, description of meiosis and then we move into the male reproductive system. So what I do is I grab out my first two slides with the title slide and our learning objectives. I copy those and then I find where that break should be and then I paste it in. So there's my first video. So now this then becomes reproductive systems part one. Uh, introduction and meiosis. So there's my first part. The learning objectives now, these two learning objectives are no longer relevant to this first video. So I actually delete that. So there's the learning objective for part one. And now I've got my first part of my video. Um, if we go back to the slide sorter, there. So what I also do is that if I have a video and it's, you know, long enough, I actually have little quizzes uh, at the end just to give students an opportunity to test their understanding of that content. So what I do, I'll insert a new slide here. So here I'll just say end of part one. Um, please, oops, please test your understanding by visiting the part one Quiz. And that's basically how I end my video. Um, so I'll have to go into Milo a little bit later on. I'll create a, a short quiz, about four questions or something, just on the content of that material so students can get an opportunity to test their understanding. So that's our first break. So now here we're in part two. We're looking at the male reproductive system. Uh, so here, part two. Our reproductive system, we go to the learning objectives. That one still covers, that one's covering the male reproductive system, but we're not looking at the female reproductive system. So we can get rid of that. There's our learning objectives. There's a second video. Again, we can um, drag a copy of that over uh, to the end. So here we've got the starting to talk about the female reproductive system. So there's another break. We'll add our two slides there then we've got quite a high bit of content here. Somewhere here we can actually finish. So here's another break here, we'll add that there and so on. So now I've got one, two, three, 
four videos uh, based off my 50 minute video. And of course you'd go through and you'd weed out uh, that extraneous information that you don't think they necessarily need to try to keep that as simple as possible. Okay, so that's sort of how I go about um, breaking down my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, so then once you've broken your PowerPoint up, uh, review the content, applying your understanding now of your cognitive load theory. So look for signaling, uh, weed out that extraneous information, think about how you're gonna present that information so you're not using too many channels at one time. Uh, so for example, here's a slide from this presentation. Uh, which is comparing mitosis and meiosis. And of course, there's lots of cognitive overload coming from this presentation, from just all this verbal information and um, uh, visual information coming at once uh, from this slide. So now applying our understanding of cognitive load, we're trying to weed out information, we're gonna to try to signal um, and so on, trying to reduce that intrinsic load. Uh, we can break it down. You can actually describe mitosis, for example. And then when you come to describe meiosis, you can slowly using animation, slowly reveal that information. So you're reducing the complexity. You're simplifying that message that you're uh, providing there. Um, you don't have too much text on the screen. Um, your words are providing a lot of the information here. The relationship of the text to the image is really important as well. So one of the um, uh, proponents of, of cognitive load theory being applied say that the text should be very closely associated with the image so that um, students make that um, link that uh, verbal and pictorial um, model there. Again, you slowly build as you describe what's going on um, and you keep building and um, releasing it upon time so that you're providing a more simplified presentation. And then you have your last little animation there. So then once you've actually got your chunked PowerPoints, you've gone through, you've tried to reduce the cognitive load as much as you can. Um, how do you go about recording your chunked PowerPoints? Uh, well, there's a number of ways you can actually do that. You can screencast, um, so you can use the Echo 360 personal capture uh, to um, capture your screen, so like I'm doing now. Um, you could actually use um, Collaborate to actually make your recordings um, as well. Uh, any screen capture software, so QuickTime, Camtasia, OBS Studio, or like we're saying, um, Blackboard Collaborate's a really good way too. Uh, you can also narrate directly into PowerPoint and export it as an MP4 or as a .MOV uh, MOV file. Uh, this is actually uh, a really interesting way uh, to do that because you actually record, you can record into each individual slide. And so that if you make a mistake, you can actually just go back and have to just re-record one slide rather than having to record uh, the whole video again. Uh, so there's a that's quite an interesting way to do that. And the way to do that, uh, hopefully you can see, um, here you've got record slideshow. Um, so when you click on that, if you say record from current slide, that'll record just one slide's narration. Uh, or if you record from the beginning, you obviously start the, the presentation beginning. So once you hit that, so now you can hopefully see this is the recording screen. So here's the record button. Um, so you get an opportunity when you're ready to start recording, just press that button. Uh, you've got little annotation tools down here as well. And so if you wanted to, uh, you could highlight certain things or you could do drawings or something which we'll talk about in a little while uh, and so on. Um, and so on. And then, of course, you press stop um, and so on. And that's that's how you actually record into it. And then when you come to... Um, when you come into uh, save, you can export it. Uh, here, so you press X, and then you can actually create a video of that recording uh, rather than actually exporting it as a PowerPoint or as a PDF or something like that. Uh, how do you present your online videos? Uh, well, you can use one of the templates demonstrated last week, uh, so you can present your videos in a standalone module. Um, you'll first need to upload your videos and host them first, either you know Echo 360. Um, and then uh, embed them or link to them. Uh, theoretically, you could upload the videos to Milo, 
but you can't actually host them in a, a visible way. Students would actually have to download them to actually view them. Uh, so you, it's better to actually have them hosted in Echo 360 and then import them into uh, one of these learning templates. Um, for example, the Integra uh, Content Builder. So I'm just going to um, uh, show what one of those looks like. So this is actually, let me just um, get rid of these for the moment. Uh, so this is the reproductive system one that I developed and this is using, as I say, the interactive content builder. And I think Jeremy used this as an idea show last week. Um, so um, it starts out with a template and then you just populate it with various things. So you can have the learning outcomes. And so here, all of the learning outcomes that were in that PowerPoint presentation I've just uh, presented here. Uh, here I've actually, the good thing about creating PowerPoint based videos is that you can export the notes and students love notes. They really get quite upset if they don't have notes to follow along with. So by actually narrating a PowerPoint slide, uh, you have that added benefit of being able to create uh, lecture notes. And so then I just um, upload them to the Milo and then I link to them uh, here in this module. And then here's my uh, video, my part one. Uh, here I've actually used the little talking head, which as we know, may be contributing to uh, cognitive load, uh, but hopefully not too much. But it also hopefully gives the students a little bit of engagement with me um, there. And this is, um, this is uploaded to uh, Echo 360. And so then I've embedded it using the uh, tool uh, associated with the uh, ICB. Um, and then here's the link to the quiz. So to test our understanding, um, please complete this quiz and then students move forward to part two. Um, did that content make you testy? Get it? Uh, mail read, anyway, moving on. There's the part two quiz. And then here's the part three quiz. Um, part three video, there's another quiz. And then uh, part four. Now, this was only a short video um well short 13 minutes it's not really that short it should be six minutes shouldn't it but um yeah i haven't quite stuck to that but um that was only a, a short component so i haven't done an extra quiz for them so again so the quiz can actually add a little bit of extra burden to the students if they keep you know, for a 50 minute video, it may take a little bit longer if they go through this process. But hopefully what we're also doing is we're actually um, giving them opportunity to test their understanding and start to move um, that content into their long term memory um, and so on. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much what it looks like how to, to, to embed it into your PowerPoint presentation. So the importance of quizzing, um, as I say, I find it important to scatter quizzes between the videos. Uh, one, because it provides feedback to the student. I suggest being overt that this is a mechanism of feedback. We know all know who've got evaluates back that says, you know, we don't get much feedback. And students don't recognize that these quizzes that we spent time creating are actually a mechanism of feedback to them. So I, I'm overt. Um, about that and I name it up as feedback. Let's get some feedback on your understanding of this content um, so that it's named up as feedback and hopefully that helps them understand that, you know, we do play more of a role than just writing red marks on a, an exam paper, for example. Uh, the other thing is it provides feedback to you. Um, so you can go and have a look at the uh, results of those quizzes. If there's a topic of concern that students got wrong, then you can actually focus on that. Uh, if you actually get to have a face to face or an online tutorial or something, then you can focus on that and help uh, spend some time on that topic and expand upon it and help students understand that content a little bit better. It's also important as we move into the online environment, student engagement is really important too, making sure everyone's, you know, keeping track with their learning. And so looking at student engagement with these quizzes gives you a good understanding about how they're performing. Um, formative quizzes gives them feedback. It also gives you feedback on um, student engagement as well. And of course, it helps to keep them active in a somewhat passive medium. So these screencast videos are less engage, less active, I suppose, than other ways. And of course, you can do other things. You can embed various quizzes inside videos and that nowadays as well. 
Uh, lastly, I just wanted to sort of finish up on uh, this idea of these Khan Academy style drawing videos. Um, so this is an example of a Khan Academy video. This was looking at the um, embryology of development of the cardiovascular system, which I actually used to uh, before preparing for a practical <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. It's a really lovely video. Um, it's classically uses the black background. He's pre-drawn a number of things here, um, but then labels them up and students can follow along as well. These sort of drawing videos, they're great for cognitive load. They're simplifying because you've got just a pictorial view and then you can add the text uh, and students can follow along and it builds up over time. So it's a little bit like having animations in that sense that you're slowly revealing the complexity. So you're simplifying that presentation. You're matching the modality. So you're actually using pictorial and auditory, uh, a verbal, um, channels at the same time. Um, it keeps students active in their learning process because most of them will draw along with you and they tend to like that. And of course it adds a personal feel. You can see this is not, you know, uh, a textbook image. I mean, it's fantastic, but it's it's your own personal handwriting. Um, if you make a, a, you know, a really rubbish drawing, you can laugh about it. You know, everyone re recognizes that you're, you're a person and, and you, you're not a um, textbook. <laughs> so, you know, you get your own personal feel as you draw along as well. And you make mistakes and you erase them and, and, and that. So it becomes a, quite a nice um, experience. So how can you actually create these uh, sort of videos? Yeah, you can use an iPad and an iPencil to capture that as well. Um, you can use that um, recording that I sh just showed you with the PowerPoint. And instead of having a lots of information on that slide, you could just have a blank slide, use that annotate tool, and you could actually draw. Um, so that's a way to create them. Um, you can import unlabeled diagrams, and then you could label them. And that way students could follow along with their own lecture notes. And so again, you're still building up that complexity. So you're simplifying it for them um, in an engaging way. You can import incomplete diagrams and can complete them. So you might have the Krebs cycle, for example, not all of the parts of it finished. Um, so you then finish it together with the students. One thing that I've been using uh, is a Chrome extension called Page Marker. Um, so there's actually, I've got a link to it at the end of this presentation uh, for this extension. Basically allows you to draw directly into a, um, a web-based uh, browser. And Bill Connolly um, uh, actually created for me a blank web page. So this is just a white web page um, that you can link to. Um, and then using the drawing tool, I actually can sit and draw my little presentation here and explain to students about the structure of the seminiferous tubules, for example. Now, one thing I use is a uh, drawing tablet. Uh, which just plugs into your computer and he uses the pen instead of having to use your mouse to draw and that could be a little bit uh, tricky. So we have one of these available in our level two recording studio that you can borrow um, uh, or if you're going to be doing lots of these videos you might get um, be able to persuade the school to, to buy you one uh, or something. I can't speak for them but um, who knows. Um, I do find drawing with a, a pen style um, much better than drawing with a mouse. Um, I do find that my drawings with a mouse are quite rubbish. Um, the other thing you can do if you like to draw up with pen and paper. Uh, no, that tablet, so that drawing tablet is uh, basically for any computer. It's just a USB connection and you just plug it in. You just need to download the uh, drivers and the software and those are free downloads from the company. Um, and you just got to make sure you match with the type of device you're using. And um, yeah, it all works it works really well. Uh, we have this document camera now too in the MS2 level two recording studio that we set up. And um, so you can actually use this to record drawing on pen and paper um, to help create your, um, your recordings as well. The other thing about the, um, uh, this page marker is it actually has an export function as well. Um, so you can actually export it afterwards and you can upload it to your PowerPoint lecture notes for the students if you want to, or you might incorporate it in your own um, lecture notes or uh, PowerPoints. Uh, so this is available too, sitting right next to me now as I speak. Um, uh, hasn't been used very much. It's a direct HDMI plug-in or a USB connection, and you can just create drawings off, um, capturing your drawings, just like a document camera in a lecture theatre. Um, but this is just a little personal one that you can have. 
All right, so that's pretty much it. I just wanted to um, allude to, uh, as I finish, there's a number of things I haven't discussed, but one of the things that I, I think needs to be considered for the future, and I think the university is looking at this, is of course accessibility. As we create these online resources, we should hopefully be looking towards um, creating closed captioning and or transcripts. Now, at the moment, there's not a very easy way to do that, but I think they're looking at it for Echo 360. Um, and um, other potential ways that we might be able to create these to, to help people with um, disabilities and also students with English as a second language, it also helps as well. Or in the busy person who's got a busy life, kids running around, um, they may not be able to hear the audio of your videos, but they can be, be able to read uh, that, that uh, presentation. So uh, closed captioning helps many, many people. Okay, so there's the references for the different components um, that I talked about today, including the, the page marker um, plugin. Uh, thanks very much for your time, and I hope you found that useful.